Thank you all so much for joining tonight. Um, we're really excited for you all to be here. Um, we have an amazing panel of speakers, including Alyssa, Itisha, and I. Um, I believe um, Itisha will be pulling up the slides shortly, but in the meantime, um, uh, we can just like quickly uh, say something about myself is that I'm a third year medical student at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'll pass it on to Alyssa. Hi, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, um, and I'll be uh, doing internal medicine at University of Kentucky next year, um, and I'll pass it over to Itisha. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm just making sure I'm sharing my screen so I can share the slides. So my name is Itisha Jefferson, and I'm a medical student at Loyola University Strich School of Medicine. Um, and I'm ha happy that everyone came onto the call. So let me just do this. And I'll put on my video momentarily. Okay. So let's share it. And can everyone see the screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Awesome. Um, and so we can skip to the next slide. Okay. All righty. And then we just introduced all of ourselves. And then before we jumped in, we also wanted to say that um, today is going to be very informal. And so, you know, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we don't expect this to take the full hour unless y'all have some amazing questions. Um, we're more than happy to stay um, after as well too and um, you know this we just want this to be as interactive and as engaging as possible and so I know that these zoom calls can get some you know boring and dry sometimes and so we definitely don't want that to be the case because advocacy is super fun and we want you all to get involved especially in through Doctors for America and so um, yeah without a further ado we can go to the next slide. All right, so we're just going to get started by sharing a little bit about what each of us has done kind of getting involved in advocacy just to hopefully lay some groundwork that anyone can be an advocate. Um, and I was just starting off by talking about in medical school, we created um, a group called the Physicians Action Network, um, which is based mostly in Columbus, Ohio. So it started as more of like a state slash local organization that we were able to do some advocacy rallies alleys such as the picture um, on the left. So I just kind of wanted to break down that like advocacy can like look like a lot of different things. It doesn't always have to be like a grand event or a grand um, essay or something you've done. It could just be as easy as showing up and supporting a cause such as this anti-hate rally that we did in Columbus. Um, and I had originally gotten involved with Doctors for America by getting like on an email chain or seeing something about an advertisement for one of their advocacy grand rounds. And I decided just to show up and learn something and then slowly get more and more involved. Um, and so it also can just start off with having an interest in a topic and eventually it can develop into leadership roles. Um, one of the other advocacy ways that I've chosen to get involved in is submitting testimony at, um, at our state level in Ohio. Um, and so that's one other way that I've um, chosen to take part in advocacy with submitting a bill and then um, just kind of highlighting some other organizations I've worked with, such as the Medical Student with Disability and Chronic Illness and Equality Toledo, an LGBTQ organization um, in Toledo. Ohio. And so just wanted to give like an idea of just some ways that I've been involved in ways that you can build up your leadership and advocacy um, roles. And we can go to Anand. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. And just a little bit about my journey as well, too, is that my ad healthcare advocacy journey um, really started uh, more formally in undergrad um, when I joined the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, um, specifically the Sacramento chapter. Um, they always will have my heart. Um, I That was the first place where I really got to understand how I can make change on a structural, more organizational level. Not only, you know, I've... Prior to that, I've been on student council for my school and, um, you know, seen things done locally, like within my own, um, you can call it circle, but through NAMI, I was exposed to how, you know, one voice can actually have an impact on a statewide level or even a national level. And so, um, you know, I'm forever thankful for the lessons I learned there and the great mentors I found there. Um, and then as I transitioned into medical school, one of the first organizations I joined was the American Medical Association. Um, as And through that very large organization, they do have a medical student section. And so through that organization from my first year of medical school, I had um, pursued 
pursued multiple leadership opportunities within it. Um, I'm currently the chair of the Committee on Legislation and Advocacy. I am now the chair elect of the Medical Student Section Governing Council. And so um, I will begin my term as one year term as chair of the Medical Student Section in June of 2024 until I graduate medical school in June of 2025. And, um, you know, this has really taught me um, a lot about healthcare advocacy. And I really was it opened my eyes to how much we can do as a group of, you know, budding physicians and how much power we can have, and especially navigating such a large organized medicine group. Um, AMA is one of the largest, if not the largest organized medicine groups in the country. And so, you know, with that, it has its pros and cons. And so navigating that structure, it has really opened my eyes and really shown me the power that a large organized medicine group can have and how I can take these lessons back to all the other groups and organ organizations and um, interests that I have. And so um, as well, similarly, um, in my medical school in the photo in the top right, I know it's kind of dark, but um, it was actually a screenshot of a news um, uh, segment that I was fortunate to be part of. It was specifically on street medicine. Um, one of my advocacy passions um, is street medicine. And um, this was kind of the first time where I was able to start an initiative and see it all the way through ever in my life on a, this large of a scale where I was able to, you know, work with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, along with the Street Medicine Institute, along with the Texas Medical Association and American Medical Association and lots of other interested parties um, to essentially pass a CMS um, place of service code allowing the street to be billable. And so that was a huge announcement that happened last summer. And um, it essentially allows physicians who practice on the street to be reimbursed. And that's huge because um, historically street medicine organizations had been relying on donations. And so um, we're super proud of that. And I know I started my own street medicine group at in uh, TCU where I attend medical school. And um, it's just been amazing to see how much passion medical students have and how we can capitalize on that when we were all work together. And this was definitely not just a one man team. And like I mentioned to all of these stakeholders coming together. And most importantly, I wanted to highlight that this was originated by a group of medical students that I had the opportunity to work with across the country. And um, I hope that, you know, I get to work with you all one day and to help you you all or, you know, vice versa to push for our advocacy and continue to improve our own healthcare system. Um, similarly, um, some of my gr more groundwork that I was able to take part of in um, medical school was through the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship. And that was a really amazing opportunity to learn more about the health inequities that occur within my own community. Um, I think this was very hands on. And, you know, especially when we're doing a lot of advocacy work, we can kind of get lost in the mundane things of, or we can honestly feel hopeless at times where we feel as if, you know, all of this work is amounting to nothing. But I think the community service aspect and really engaging with the community members at the end of the day was really powerful and impactful to my journey and really emphasize the fact that um, you need to find a good balance between both where, you know, you can't just be doing advocacy for me personally, at least you can't, I can't just be doing advocacy 24 seven, because I feel like you know, I might get frustrated, burnt out. And so having going back to my roots, and this is something I've been doing since I've grown up, and it's a huge part of my identity is community service, and having that ability to interact and engage with folks, it's really does mean a lot to me. And that's what led me to Doctors for America. Um, Doctors for America, I found out about it through the um, Jean A. Capello Health Advocacy Fellowship that I am currently one of the fellows for this year, in which we will get into more um, later on in this presentation. But Doctors for America was one of the first organizations in medical school where I found it to be a flat organization. And, and what I mean by that is that medical students and physicians have an equal say and can pursue the same leadership opportunities. And for me personally, being part of so many different organized medicine groups within medical school, this was one of a kind. And this is what really stood out to me about Doctors for America and really honestly made me feel more empowered as a medical student, because we all know in the hierarchy of medicine that medical students are always, you know, pushed to the bottom. But I feel like medical students, we do bring in the most innovative, we are the most, you know, excited, energetic. And, um, you know, at, at most of the times, we have the most time on our hands as well, too, to do the hard work and do the and to make change. And so I really, you know, was um, mesmerized by Doctors for America's mission, especially putting patients over politics. And so it really spoke to me. And, you know, I haven't looked back, and I'm super excited and grateful to be part of this organization. And I think it does a lot of that grassroots advocacy, but um, it gives its um, uh, voice or it gives power to its members' voices, and which I really appreciate. And I think there's so much possibilities for all medical students to be, take part in it.
Okay, everyone. So I'm Aitisha, and my advocacy has started since I was a, a student at Spelman College. One of Spelman tagline, Spelman College is a historically Black college in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been the number one HBCU for the past 16, 17 years, and I'm a proud alumna of Spelman College. And one of our tagline is a choice to change the world, and that's one of the main reasons why I decided to attend college um, at Spelman. And I try to change the world the best way I can, even if it's on a small or local scale. And that choice to me is very intentional and it go dates back all the way to my um, undergraduate years. So at Spelman, I was very involved in SNMA, which is a Student National Medical Association. We also have MAPS, which is the Minority Association of Pre-Medical Students. And I have had roles from a local level to a national level, as well as many other committees. I have worked with four pre-medical board um, uh, associates, as well as was the regional nine political advocacy liaison. And I also was very involved in AMSA, which is the American Medical Student Association. And AMSA has scholarly programs, and I was a part of the Health Equity Scholars Program in addition to the co-chair. So I have started my journey for advocacy, as well as um, policy way before I started medical school. Um, after I graduated, I then did a fellowship. I did a Fulbright fellowship in South Korea where I taught. So that showed me a lot about cultural competence. And I always, the, the words doctor of medicine, which is, you know, if you put it in Greek, means teacher of medicine. So I know like me becoming a teacher at one point was very a humbling experience. And I love to impact um, students because that same thing I'm going to do with patients. And I always tell my students, you know, you have a trifecta. Like I, I one, I'm from New York, which I love being from New York. Um, two, I went to Spelman College and three, I'm Jamaican. And during that time, all my students know about Usain Bolt, so the wonderful experience. And I use those skills as far as like working with my um, teachers as well as the students and even the parents to become a better physician and medical student. After I left Korea, I then worked as a affordable as a patient navigator for the Affordable Care Act at a FQHC, which is the Federal Qualified Health Center. As you know. Um, health insurance is mandated. And I was in my community in Brooklyn to explain to the people as well as enroll them into the health marketplace. And although that was years ago, I still use the, that knowledge and certain things that I'm doing today, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later on. I then transitioned and worked um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the melanoma department doing clinical research I was a clinical research coordinator. I had no idea about MSKCC until I started a job. And to know that we had such a renowned cancer hospital uh, really made me felt very good about working at the place. But the thing is, I didn't really see a lot of diversity um, in clinical trials. And this is what really, I started looking more into melanoma and can I get skin cancer? And when I Googled, I was like, oh, snap. And the infamous singer, Jamaican singer, Bar Marley, they, he died from melanoma. So that made me get more involved into community engagement and skin cancer awareness, as well as melanoma awareness in minority communities. And I started partnering with organizations within my area in order to do so. One most notably is the Women's Dermatological Society. I started, attend, I started to attend their Play Safe in the Sun event. Um, I also went to India on a fellowship, a medical fellowship. And part of the thing that I've talked about is that India is like near the equator and it's very hot. So a lot of skin diseases and manifestation. And I wanted to do a lot more education within the melanoma sphere, um, as well as work with village health workers and rural community. I was in rural India, eight hours away from Mumbai. I have to emphasize rural because people will ask me, oh, I teach you like, how was it? It, it, it was it was an amazing time a very humbling time and I enjoyed my time in India, especially working with the village health workers and understanding how you can communicate with um, with rural population by pup using puppets or using storytelling um, because there is a language barrier. So I like how creative we were with what we didn't have. And all those experiences have led me to become a, the medical student that I am today and everything is transferable. When I started in medical school, I still continued everything that I done previously prior to med school. So I am a part of National Dermatology Interest Group Association. I'm the national 
Policy Advocacy and Diversity Chair or PAD Chair. So I do a lot of, um, one of the things I've done in medical school is have high school and elementary schools. We talk about skin health as well as in the community. Uh, I will partner with one of my representative, Congressman Danny Davis, and we will have a lot of information for disadvantaged communities around the Chicago area. Um, I also found out about Doctors for America through Dr. Google. I wanted to make sure I properly train on health equity as well as civic engagement engagement and community engagement and be around like-minded people, especially in an area in which I think I need more training in. So when I Googled, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm interested in um, clinical trials, diversity and clinical trials in general. I did work at MSKCC and, and my study was FDA audited and EME and EMA audited. And that's a lot of work going through two regulatory bodies, one that's in America and one that's in Europe. But it was a very interesting experience. So I, I didn't feel like I knew about FDA, the intricacy of FDA. So when I started looking for um, how can I increase my knowledge in FDA and understand about public commentary, I stumbled upon Doctors for America and I also came across their fellowship, the Capella Fellowship. And when I read about what it entails and what you do, I was like, okay, this is something that I can see myself represented. This is something that I feel like worked straight to my values and I love what it st stood for. I Prior to me applying, I did reach out to a current um, a previous Capello Fellow, but that year he was a current Capello Fellow. And I asked him about his experience and he loved the opportunity, especially the things that you learned throughout the year, which will which what I can use not even as a physician and a medical student, but as a patient advocate, which is for me was one thing that I'm very passionate about. My work still continued and one of the things I've done is I'm very involved into um here. I, I am a scar and alopecia patient, so I'm very involved in Scar and Alopecia Foundation, and I was on the Medical Student Executive Board. And one of the projects that I led, which I am super proud of, is I obtained ICD-10 codes for two scar and alopecia diseases, and that will be implemented in 2024 in all healthcare systems or healthcare um, like medical records. And that took me about a year or two to implement, and it's a lot of back work like groundwork, but it was so fulfilling because to have, you know, ICD-10 coding is, I call it the social security when it comes to diagnosis. And the fact that I was able to, with my team, um, to have a code for two hair loss diseases, and now we can track the prevalence of the disease, the comorbidities, and how it could be treated. It's like such a heartwarming feeling to, to really accomplish. And lastly, uh, the Center of Medicaid Services, or CMS, which is above Medicare, which impacts a lot of things that we do on a Medicaid level, I am part of three technical expert panels. So it's a way for me to understand what exactly CMS is doing. Everything, uh, these government bodies do impact how we treat patients and how we will practice medicine. And I'm nosy. I'm very, well, inquisitive. So I love to understand what are these other regulatory bodies are doing. And the best way for me to do so is for me to be involved. I stumbled across the CMS website. They had the technical expert panel application. And I was like, okay, let me apply to one tech technical expert panel. And I did. And I applied to the one that focused on the quality health exchange or the health marketplace. I used my skills that I did prior to med schools to talk about how I can be a great addition to the team. I'm the only medical student on most of these boards. Uh, two of them deals with the health marketplace and one deals with the CMS hospital rating. If you go on the CMS website, there's a way for you to rank each hospital and they get a certain star. And I'm working with a team of doctors and researchers in order to see how we can best implement this quality star rating. So I'm learning more, every day I learn more about who I am and what I do and what my purpose is, but overall, I am, an, I am about advocacy, health policy, civic engagement, community engagement, and just being a voice. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm very proud that I do with all my experiences. Great, thank you both for sharing all those um, advocacy work that you do. It's very inspiring to hear what everyone has been working on and hopefully people like throughout the, like our three presentations just kind of got an idea of like there's different ways to get involved in advocacy. And so now hopefully this is the part that you guys all came for of like, what can you do to get involved in Doctors for America? And most importantly, kind of just like, what is Doctors for America if you're new to us? Um, 
So we're an organization that mobilizes doctors and medical students and other allies to be leaders. And as Anand said, our goal is to put patients over politics um, and really do a lot of different work in different areas. Um, and so we always need more people who are interested in getting involved. Um, and so here's just a few of our like our principles. I won't read directly off the slide for you, but just the idea that everyone deserves to have a healthy life, access to care, um, high quality and affordable care. Um, and really that's our goal of all of our committees. And we'll go a little more into like the specific work that we do. So you can go to the next slide. And so we're gonna just briefly review each of our impact areas, mostly so that you guys can see if there's a certain area you're interested in getting involved in and learn a little bit more. So that's why if you wanna share maybe a topic you're interested in the chat, we can keep note of that and be in contact after this. Uh, but we'll go over our general impact areas, which are access to affordable care, community health and prevention, health justice and equity. So we can go to the um, impact areas now. Oh, you're muted, Aitisha. Thank you. So the access to affordable care, um, they focus on all the ways our patients access, pay for, and receive their medical care by advocating for universal health coverage, affordability, quality, and equity. And there are three subgroups under the access to affordable care, such as the federal legislation and regulation, Medicaid expansion, and transformational health care. The FDA task force is also under this umbrella, but that is also on a separate slide. Some of the most notable achievements that the Access to Care Committee has done is that they have done the Medicaid expansion training, and we know how important for our patients to receive um, access to um, health insurance, especially expanding Medicaid. And that's one of the things that the Affordable Care Act harpered on a lot. So they were able to host five states and work closely with coalition to get Medicaid expansion across the finish line in North Carolina, which is awesome. Some of the things they also do is that they did a partner sign on, which means they wrote letters and statements and amicus briefs with partners on topics such as Medicare's ability to negotiate drug prices, insulin access, and more. They also have action alerts, which is something in which they talk about how we can expand um, Medicaid prescription drug affordability boards and drug affordability. They also have advocacy ground round session. And lastly, they created a addressing greed in healthcare campaign and drafted a declaration against greed in healthcare. And they launched monthly advocacy skill building sessions for their um, members. From left to right is Dr. Eric Sullivan. He is the chair of the Access to Care um, Committee as well as Raj Reddy, he's a MD candidate. Right now, he's, he's also a 2023 to 2024 Capella Fellow, and he's also on the FDA task force. And the program manager, if you're interested in learning more about this information about access to care, we have Marlou Steven Stevenson. She is the person you can reach out to in order to learn more about this committee and how you can get involved. The one I'm part of is the FDA task force, and I love the FDA task force. Uh, we are a very small group, but we do a lot. And it's it started about a couple of years ago, so we're still in a, we are still in in our infancy, but we have done a lot of great things throughout the inception since we started. Um, and basically, we educate and mobilize and empower a group of DFA members and clinicians to understand more about the FDA, which can be very confusing not only to patients but also to medical students. We don't, we just know that FDA is a standard when it comes to getting drugs approved. But what does FDA really do um, as far as not only drugs, but the medical devices and do they, you know, people who have supplements and all those things. And what when we know that a, a drug is going to market and they're having a, a, a PDUFUA or let's say they have in a, a committee to see if this drug can go to market, what does that mean to have a, pop, a public commentary? So that's one thing. Those are some of the things that we do. We also learn about various bills and, and, and how it impacts patient care, such as the reforming of the accelerated pathway for drugs. And one of the things that I love is that we have the opportunity to do fly-ins. Uh, we went to several fly-ins and one of the fly-ins we, we were able to meet with Dr. Bunkus, who is very involved. She has a position at the FDA. We went to the FDA building, so I love that. We also went uh, recently to uh, the Eisenhower building in order to do a lot more work on policy. 
and this is one of the pictures that we went to and we well literally two weeks ago we visited about seven offices about uh, a, a lot of senator offices with more senators than representatives to talk about how can we increase the funding on fda which is super important our appropriation bill and some of the concerns that we have with some of the bills that are coming to market when it comes to drugs so we done a lot um with the fda task force and there's a lot of opportunities such as we met with cms um, and to talk about to, to talk with CMS and how we can work together, we recently had a conference of medical professionals and societies to see how we can all band together to understand more about FDA and how can we be a better voice for our patients. And we had we had societies from um, the family practice physicians. We had NPs. We had ASCO, which is the Society of um, of cancer who came in. We had about, about 15 or 17 organizations who showed up in DC for us to have a conference. And that's like the first thing we're doing. Uh, and hopefully we have many more. We also have opportunities for public comment. So anytime the FDA have like a release statement, the public can write a commentary on it. You can write one too, but sometimes it's could be kind of confusing on how to write a public commentary, what to write, because whatever happens on the internet stays on the internet. So it's good to have like a body of people who have like-minded, who 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 you share the same um, mind with, who can write and help you write um, opportunities to talk about how we feel about certain things. And one of the biggest thing uh, uh, is when we talked about McKenna, um, we also discussed the information about the FDA versus uh, the the people in Texas, when it comes to one of the abortion uh, drugs that are now trying to, they're trying to stop uh, distributing uh, the Alzheimer's drug that had a big issue with how it was uh, with the accelerated approval. We also do a lot of news appearance, uh, which is a very great opportunity. And you can also write op-ed pieces. I know a lot of students do mostly research, but there are opportunities where you can write your own op-ed. And, um, and we also, they also encourage us to get involved in FDA through the advisory committee application. And that is something where anytime uh, a drug is coming to market or they have a discussion, doctors and, and also professionals can be a part of the committee. And there are several committees within the FDA uh, the DFA FDA task force will support your application if you are interested in applying. So I love how we're able to have an uh, impact on something that impacts so many individuals and, and 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 be a voice. And this is like the only organization that I know that's doing that. So I, when it comes to me as a medical student, so I love that. Uh, and we do have it's open to medical students, physicians as well as residents. So we will welcome you to the FDA task force. And the people who are in charge, we have Dr. Reshma. She is an assistant professor of medicine at Yale, and she is very involved in FDA. She publishes a lot, and I learned so much from her. Every time she speaks, I just have my little pen and paper out because there are certain things I, do, I don't even know. I mean, we don't learn this in medical school, but it's like the knowledge that she has on FDA and when we go and advocate and the things she, the nuances she knows about certain bills, it's just awesome to see her um, in action. And we also have Taryn who uh, help us uh, as a program manager, and she is awesome with setting up meetings and making sure that we have the opportunities to, that we do have. And it just, it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great team. I love it. Alrighty. And then the other impact area we have is the community health and prevention. And um, that's the one is, I'm specifically part of, and I'm one of the subcommittee co-chairs along with Danny. I know she's on this call um, for the gun violence prevention uh, subcommittee focus. And so um, just a little bit about the uh, community health and prevention and kind of what each subcommittee does is that essentially um, uh, the gun violence prevention subcommittee uh, currently, we're actually, you know, we partner with organizations such as Brady and Newtown Alliance. Um, we uh, specifically are also getting involved with like the lunch and lobby calls where we call our representatives um, to advocate for certain bills. Um, we are currently meeting with the um, uh, White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention that was recently opened um, under President Biden's administration. And so lots of exciting work going on in the gun violence prevention subcommittee. Um, we also work just nationally across the um, with so many different organizations and so many different members, especially now more than ever, given that um, we are in a time where 
um, movement in this advocacy space is possible. And so um, we're currently working on lots of great initiatives and we'd love to have, um, you know, you all join. Um, there's also the public health outreach one. And um, we actually have a co-chair opening. Um, one of the chairs is Dr. Polly Witts, um, but we also are looking for one more co-chair to help alongside with her. So if this speaks to you and their mission statement, um, definitely please feel free to reach out to Keisha, as you saw earlier on this call. Um, she's wonderful. And um, so a little bit more about the public health outreach. Um, they, you know, currently they're working on decreasing vaccine hesitancy surrounding measles. Um, they also partner with organizations such as Vote ER, especially now that we're in an election year. Um, we're really big on um, civic engagement. And then lastly, we have the substance use disorder um, subcommittee. And so um, uh, they are also doing great work. It was actually founded by Alyssa. Um, and so currently they're working to create the, or they've created the Addiction Medicine 101 toolkit. Um, they uh, have lots of initiatives surrounding harm edu harm reduction education. And then um, they're also currently working with Dr. Kolodny, who's one of the presidents of, uh, or he is the president of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescription Prescribing. So lots of um, partnership collaborations, lots of um, work to be done. And so if you're really interested in any of these areas, um, I highly recommend reaching out to Keisha. And as you can see here, um, for the larger community health and prevention, the vice chair is Alyssa, and the chair is um, Dr. Akbarnia. So so um, uh, once again, speaking to that flat organization, you can see her medical students and physicians and residents all working side by side to um, for a common purpose. Great. Great. And then we'll hit our last impact area, which is the health justice and equity, um, which is also um, kind of coordinated by Keisha. So feel free to email her if you would like to get involved. So under the um, health justice and equity pillar, we have reproductive rights, um, sexual and gender health, decriminalization and liberation. So in terms of the reproductive rights, um, kind of, you know, advocating to be able to protect those rights. And since we are a national organization, sometimes our efforts are dedicated to state level issues, but also working on a national level as well. Um, and this committee recently organized a trip to DC to advocate for mifepristone um, with the US Food and Drug Administration against the versus the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. So they did a lot of great um, rallies and education around that, um, that trial. And then the sexual and gender health also is a great organ, um, a great group to join, um, trying to help make sure that we can combat some of the legislation that affects transgender members of our community, and just really trying to help um, help like pr protect the well being of transgender and non binary youth especially. Um, and we'll share a link to um, a event tomorrow that they're hosting about honing your gender health narrative, um, which Anand just shared in the chat. So feel free to check that out. Um, and then finally, the decriminalization and liberation group, um, complete um, abolition of harmful and oppressive systems, um, especially with our minority populations. This is a really great group that does a lot of work um, in various sectors. Um, one of their popular ones is they try to help raise um, awareness for the importance of like healthcare and incarcerated patients. So they have some great um, resources for that online and also work a little bit too with substance use and there's some overlap with that. So feel free to reach out. Um, and again, this is an example where the chair is a practicing attending physician and then a vice chair is a resident. So really you can see again that everyone gets involved. Um, so we can head to the next slide. And um, we are all three, all three of us are part of the Gene A. Capella Health Advocacy Fellowship. Uh, me and Alyssa was part of the fellowship from 2022 to 2023, and Anand is the current fellow right now. And it's named after Gene A., Dr. Gene A. Capello. Uh, he was a beloved member of the National Physicians Alliance, a board of directors, and a founder leader of the organization Council of Consumers. Uh, he also served as a co-chair of the NPA Secure Healthcare for All campaign and was deeply committed to the mission of uh, Doctors for America, which is basically building a physician organization dedicated to patient center advocacy. And it's a unique opportunity to build leadership and advocacy skills to improve the health of your patients and your community. Uh, about 12 students, not 12, but well, not students, but 12 individuals, extraordinary leaders are selected. And we meet monthly to learn from experts. So each month we learn about a certain topic some of the topics we do go over is advocacy, action planning, media relations, communication, strategy, engagement, 
your um, legislator storytelling, um, how to write an opt-in piece and digital advocacy. The program is open to medical students, residents, practice physicians, and retirees. Uh, one of the things that you must do as an advocacy fellow, as a Capello fellow, is you have to attend monthly advocacy leadership meetings. We meet, we met mostly in the evening and it's once a month. You also have to participate in an impact area subcommittee meeting. Uh, and during the whole entire year, you have to think about a project that you yourself um, is leading and you have to present it at the DFA National Leadership Conference. All right, and then we were just gonna briefly review our roles. I'll just go over this because I think we um, pretty much um, hit the nail on the head on this one so far, but just trying to show that there's ways that medical students can hold leadership roles within Doctors for America. Um, we each did a Capello Fellow year, but that doesn't mean that that's a requirement to get involved in any of these committees. I started as a subcommittee chair and then was asked to then be the um, co, the vice chair for the um, overall subcommittee. Um, on in, is working with the GVP subcommittee and Aitisha does a lot of work with the FDA task force. Um, so just examples of ways that you can be involved and we'll go over a little bit more later, but we can go to the next slide. And one of the things I just wanted to share with everyone is advocacy, it can be challenging and it, it by any, especially if you want to develop something from scratch, or you can just join organizations such as Doctors for America. But I know that sometimes you reach out to an attendant and you want to do something within your community. Um, I know a non-talk about the I, Albert Schweitzer. And one of the things with Schweitzer is that you have to develop your project from scratch and have uh, measurements to go alongside with it. So for myself, well, anytime I think about a new project or I want to get involved in certain things, I always do current events. I had to do it when I was in elementary school. You know, you read a newspaper and you have to think about the who, what, where, what, and why, and how. So that's what I use in order to, to for me to figure out what I want to do. So I always start with like, who am I? Who are you? Who you are today it may not be who you are the next few years. But who are you and what are your values and your purpose? Um, who you like to work with uh, the, or collaborate with the person or the organization? Um, and what do you like to do? So I always think about what, like, what is your passion? What is your mission? I mentioned earlier that one thing that I look for is that I, I took a choice to change the world. And that's like one of the things I try to do. So I look at my goals and then my sub goals and I go from there. Uh, and what do you love to do? And what do you hope to accomplish? Anytime you're working with a certain community or a certain event or a certain project, there are certain things that you're looking to do at that particular time. It doesn't have to be a grand scale either. It can be very small. And what community you would like to target? Do you wanna target the homeless population? Do you wanna target um, people who um, who are, um, who are coming to America, like I, my parents are, are were both uh, uh, Caribbean and they immigrants. Do you want to target that population? What exactly do you want to target? Um, where do you want it to be more of a virtual thing, an in-person thing, a local thing, or a global thing? When do you like to do it? Do do you want to do it in the next month? Do you want to do it in the next three to six months, a year? Uh, is it something that's short term versus long term? Or do you want continuity? Why do you want to do this? Like why this problem or issue? What influenced you to say, hey, you know what? I want to do this right now. Like why now? And more importantly, why you? Why do you think you're the one that should do it, can do it, and will follow through it in completion? And if and and most of these things we won't know until we start thinking about it. But this is more like logistics standing. Like if you talk to people and you want to collaborate. These are things that you have to think about because anyone can collaborate. And I love to collaborate with my medical students, um, my peers, because we sometimes you just need someone to bounce ideas off of. But if you need an attendant, depending on the attendant, these are things they will ask or expect you to bring to the table when you're trying to pitch ideas. And it could be also research ideas as well, which can be very challenging um, within that. And then how, like, how would this be possible? Because the logistics, you know, when we think about certain things, we don't think about like the logistics behind it. And what I love about DFA, they're very open to whatever ideas that you have. You have the support there, you have the community there, you have the students there, you have the attendance there. And I love that, right? So you have a great foundation and you can say, you know, I I want to do more often pieces or I want to get more involved with in this and the opportunity is there for that. Um, when I do certain things, I always ask about what's my impact and how would I measure my impact? And I know we don't really think about the impact. We just do the work and then we 
move on. But most people who get grants or write grants or they have to show the things that they're doing and you have to know like what the impact was. And most importantly, when you are on residency interviews, sometimes people want to know like, okay, you did this, but how many people did you target? Like, what did you do? How do you know you made a difference? Did you go back? to see if you made a difference, is it continuous or did you pass it along? And it really showed like, oh, okay, like you're doing, like you know why you're doing it, how you're doing it and things of that nature. Now you can start from any one of these places. It all depends on what you want to do. Um, and sometimes we get ideas by reading. I, I know I read drama a lot. So reading or things that are on the news and you say, you know what? I want to delve more into it. And then you just go down and start seeing like, hey, no one is doing it. Or maybe people are doing it, but not in your community, not in a rural area, not in an urban area, not with, you know, certain population groups and think, hey, maybe I can bridge that gap in healthcare. But those are like the tips that I use when I when I think about my project ideas. Great. Thanks, Aitisha. Um, we just have two more slides. So just stick with us. We're almost there. Um, so just a little bit more again of like why you're here, of how to get involved. So one way to get involved is to, to attend the Advocacy Grand Round events, which generally one of these um, subcommittees hosts about one a month. And so you can look on um, our website to see when those events are and attend ones that interest you. And that's generally a great way to get started just to see the kind of work that's going on. Um, and then two, if you're interested in becoming a sustaining DFA member, um, then you'll have access to all the emails and be able to get on the email list. Um, and we have a discount code too on the next slide. And um, Audrey shared that in the in the chat as well. Um, and then the third way that we're hoping some of you guys will take part in is to join one of these subcommittees and you can join more than one if you're interested and have the time. And generally the commitment for this is just one meeting a month is when we have our subcommittee planning meetings. Um, and that's when we really get work done, brainstorm next projects. And then a lot of the work can be done on your free time in between those meetings. So there's no specific obligation of how many meetings you have to come to. You just come when you're able, work on what projects interest you. So it can be very manageable with a busy med student schedule. Um, and just to remind, remind you guys that the committees are the access to affordable care, which included the FDA task force and access to care, um, health justice and equity, community health and prevention. So feel free to take a screenshot of this, take a picture so that you can email these folks if you're interested in joining. Um, and again, like joining the subcommittee is generally just one meeting a month, come as you go. So we really hope that it's not too intimidating for you guys to want to get involved. And then our national leadership conference is in Washington, D.C. of this year, June 6th through the 9th. Um, and as a medical student, I love attending these events. I went to Chicago last year. You get to network with a lot of incredible physicians um, and physician allies, learn a lot of important skills, um, get to meet with legislatures and do other advocacy work around the area. Um, so these are just a few of the ways that you can get involved. Um, and also, if you go to our website, just Doctors for America, if anyone wants to just kind of share the general website, you can review all of these subcommittees and also sign up um, for your interest area online as well. Um, and we can go to the next slide. I just want to add for the National Leadership Conference the day before, um, we also have the pre the FDA um, meeting as well, a pre-conference of the FDA. So that would be a great opportunity for you to learn more about the FDA task force as well. Yeah, great point. Um, and then here's our um, DFA membership promotion. Um, you can get 50% off um, a, a medical student or resident uh, tier uh, membership. Um, and so here's just like the link and we sent those information, but also, but you don't have to become a member. It's just become a member of the subcommittees. Like you can come to the meetings, see if it's something you're interested in getting involved in, go to the AGRs. Those are open to members and non-members. Um, and just see if you feel like you like the work that's being done. Um, and then you can choose to join after as well. So don't feel obligated to, if you haven't joined to become a true member that you can't be involved in some of the work that we're doing. Um, and so with that, that kind of wraps up just our overview of what's going on. Um, again, feel free to take a picture of this, um, this slide so that you can contact us with any questions after the meeting. And then again, just following us on social media. Um, that's a really great way just to see the type of work going on, get reminders about different meetings that you can attend. Um, and I feel like each of us will attend, you know, a few here and there every month just to see different um, events going on, but usually they're all very educational and they're all available um, on YouTube as well. If you ever get bored in clinical rotations, that's what sometimes I'll do is I'll pull up a, an old, um, an old DFA event while I'm waiting on patients to arrive. Um, 
And with that, feel free to hop on either if you have a question on your, your mic or type it in the chat. Um, but we hope that overall this just showed that it's, like DFA is very approachable for like medical students and manageable to get involved in and it doesn't have to be um, very scary. We're all it's all very fun. And even the physicians like working with the physicians, it's great networking. Everyone's always really nice. Um, and it's very laid back. Right. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, and feel free to, you know, come to a meeting, just see what we do. You're welcome to like sit in and then decide how involved you want to be later on too. That's the best thing about DFA is it's very low commitment. Um, Like Anand just had his step like a couple weeks ago and was able to step back when he needed to and take the time to do board exams when you can. And then when you have free time, come and join us again. So there's no monthly or meeting requirement, anything like that. So I found it to be pretty manageable. Um, and I found too, not that it's like, you know, the most important thing, but like in residency interviews, like advocacy is becoming like such a bigger and bigger topic. I had someone say that advocacy is the new research and that they looked for people that were involved in that. Um, and so making the time to have a bigger impact on the world while also still promoting your own ability to match at like great places. Those are, you know, helpful to have both of those things. So you're not wasting your time no matter what you choose to get involved in. Yeah, Taylor, that's a, a great question. Um, personally, I really liked like this organization because I could start attending meetings and just slowly getting involved in projects already started. Kind of like Aitisha said, it can be very daunting to like start your own project on something. And so usually as like a med student, just trying to find your way, joining an organization that's doing the work that you want to be involved in is really great. Um, so for like exam for an example of like in Toledo, Ohio, where I'm rotating, I was interested in doing a little bit more with like LGBTQ advocacy. And so like Quality Toledo was already doing a lot of that work, already putting out action alerts. So I like joined their email list and reached out and asked like in what ways I could help. So I think like for personally, I think like joining an organization already doing the efforts and seeing like where they can use you is a really great way to start. Um, and if anyone else has like a thought on that. Yeah, I think just to briefly add on to that, too, is that um, reaching out to, you know, any one of us here on, um, you know, Alyssa, I teach her, I is a great place to start as well, too. Um, and, you know, it doesn't even have to just be one of us three. It can be any medical student you see who's around you who's getting involved in advocacy work, because, you know, in this space, I think we're all we know and understand that there's power in, um, you know, multiple voices. And so we're always looking for more friends, peers, um, and to expand our networks, because that's how we get advocacy done. And so um, I think, you know, if you're trying to find a place to start, the best place to start is um, looking to your own peers and um, reaching out to people, folks you see around you who are um, getting involved in advocacy and seeing, you know, is there a space for me in this space or and if not, I guarantee you, um, we can find you a space and a spot because there's lots of work to be done. <laughs> yeah, and I think one other thing when I start, started getting involved in ad advocacy was feeling like I didn't have enough skills that I brought to the table. I didn't have this like incredible resume of all these like fellowships and activities, but most of the time like organizations don't necessarily need that when you're coming in like they want someone that's just interested in doing the work and can develop some of those advocacy skills um which when I was applying for the Capello fellowship I was like oh I don't know if I'm really qualified as an advocate but then you know just knowing that advocacy comes in all forms and it doesn't have to be necessarily writing a bill or doing all these you know high level things just to get involved and build up your skill set so that later on you can do some of those larger projects so I just wouldn't be afraid to get started and don't feel like if you don't have all the all the resume builders yet, that doesn't mean you can't be valuable to the team. And just to add on to that, sometimes it's just getting started, which is the hardest thing, right? Like once you're in it, it's, it, it gets a little bit more easy. But the first thing is saying, hey, you know, I can do it and be confident in your skills. Every skills that we have, 
are transferable. You'd be surprised where, you know, people who are in business are now in medicine and vice versa. Anything you learn from your previous life can be utilized. Um, and we have people who have never had any experience in advocacy and they do an amazing job because their skills are transferable. And it's something that you can always learn and, and keep up. It's not something that, oh, okay, only a select few can know how to do it. The fact that you have a passion for it, that's even, that's, that's great enough. Right, like this thing, the fact that you want to become involved, uh, it may be ch challenging at points on how to, but once we, within DFA, the how we have that because you can have many different projects and we have people who will support you and what your vision is. And then you have, and you can collaborate with so many students as well. Um, and Anand mentioned that there's also the American Medical Association uh, as well as the Student National Medical Association. So there are other organizations as well to get your feet wet that may have like a mentorship program as well that's for students, by students uh, to start there. But with DFA, it's an open arm. You don't need to have a lot of experiences because at, at the end of the day, we, we we love the fact that you just want to help and join the cause. Yep, all great, great points. Any other questions? Thanks, Danny, for sharing that. And again, if you have any questions or are interested in like learning a little bit more about the different impact areas, feel free to email any of us or any of those coordinator emails that we shared as well. Everyone's more than happy to get you involved and send you information just to sit in on a meeting. All right, well, I think we're all set then. We can go ahead and wrap up and thanks for everyone for coming and everyone for sharing your stories and hopefully we'll get a few more people interested in joining and helping us. Oh, and thank you, Alyssa, Aitisha, and Anon for your informative presentation. Thank you so much for taking time out of your hectic schedules um, to, to do this presentation and to share your stories on how you all advocate. And for those who are listening in, again, encourage you to advocate and please don't hesitate to reach out. We don't bite as a DFA staffer. We're pretty cool. Uh, so please reach out and happy to help plug you in. and. Um, go from there. So with that, have a lovely evening and we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye.